very good morning uh, to everyone able to join our webinar this morning. Uh, for those that have joined our, our sort of previous three, this this constitutes the the fourth in our series with uh, Arc Workplace Risk. Um, really grateful to them for their support in bringing this series to you. Uh, I think we've had three uh, cracking sessions so far, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, this one will be. Um, uh, as as much, but uh, yeah, hopefully even more informative than the previous three and uh, uh, excellent speakers that we've got lined up for you today. Um, you'll recognise one of the faces, uh, which is, is David Hills. Uh, David is uh, Senior Director at, at Arc Workplace Risk and uh, has been our sort of main contributor to the previous three webinars. I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Russ Timpson, and uh, Russ is a, a fire safety expert, um, started off his career uh, in the fire, fire, fire brigade, um, has uh, done several senior um, health and safety and fire risk roles in big organisations like uh, uh, Virgin Atlantic and uh, BA and uh, other organisations, uh, won various awards for his, um, his expertise and uh, really delighted that he's able to join us this morning and give us uh, his perspectives, uh, particularly on fire risk. And then our, our third uh, speaker um, hasn't uh, been able to join us so far, uh, but uh, uh, hopefully will uh, be able to, to join us later in the webinar. Uh, that is uh, uh, Marianne Bowring. Um, Marianne, we'd specifically um, asked to join us uh, to give the uh, uh, property manager's perspective. Um, uh, I know Mary from uh, many years of, of working at, uh, at Ringley, where she's a group managing director, and uh, she brings um, extensive experience to the leasehold sector, but uh, also knows very active in built to rent and uh, a regular industry commentator on safety and other property management issues. So hopefully we'll get any technical issues ironed out with, with Marianne and she'll, she'll join us a, a little later in the, the webinar. But uh, that doesn't stop us uh, starting our programme. And the, the, the format for this morning is for uh, David and, and Russ to present some slides, and then we'll allow Marianne to make uh, her contribution, and then we'll enter discussion and Q&A. Uh, a couple of housekeeping arrangements. Um, the first is um, a reminder, if you'd like to ask questions, to uh, yeah, please use the, the Q&A function for doing, doing that. Um, you're welcome to put up uh, comments in the chat, but uh, uh, easier, um, certainly from the chairman's perspective, if we get the, the, the questions of channeling through the, the Q&A function. And then a reminder also, because uh, I know it's a, it's a sort of regular question, that uh, uh, yeah, the, the full webinar uh, will be available after, after the event. That normally goes up about 24 hours later um, on BPF website and uh, also on our YouTube account. So um, if you want to review uh, to today's proceedings, then uh, please uh, feel free to, 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 to look at that again. Without uh, further ado then, um, I'm going to in, uh, let uh, David start us and uh, take us through his slides. We've already got those on screen. So David, over to you. Good morning. Thank you very much, Ian. I uh, really do appreciate that. Um, yes, my name's David Hills, and, and many of you know that I've been uh, dealing with a number of these uh, presentations um, over the last uh, few months. Um, today we're looking at the future of fire risk assessments. Um, the future for fire risk assessments is not just based upon the legislative response that the government have, have made to the Grenfell Tower inquiry, but also on how enforcers are, are reacting and in addition how others are starting to react. We are seeing, um, certainly in, in, our, in our business, we are seeing uh, a vastly increased uh, interest from not only the property managers, um, who quite rightly have an interest in the assessment, but also the owners of buildings, but interestingly, tenants as well. And so we're seeing a cultural change there, and it's certainly a welcome change. Um, we, we're very, very happy that um, we're seeing that um, across the, the whole of the industry. So today I, I wanna look at the legislative changes that are affecting uh, those fire risk assessments, and then also look at why I believe we actually currently, whilst we're waiting for the legislation to catch up, generating what I like to call a perfect storm. 
Um, and then I'm going to hand on to uh, to Russ to take you through some of the um, other elements of, of risk in respect of insurance and, and other areas as well. So why are we why are we here? Well, because the government's intent following Grenfell is to actually learn the lessons and make some changes to remedy what Dame Judith Hackett suggested were systemic issues within our industry. We've got to strengthen the whole of the system for building safety. And that is going to be achieved by introducing what they like to call a new era of accountability. I think what's very interesting uh, though, is that this era of accountability is gonna take some time to come into force. We are expecting by um, October this year for the building safety bill to be, uh, or to at least receive royal assent. And there's gonna be a program thereon uh, of introducing the new regulations that are required, but also um, to see the changes actually manifest themselves. But the minister in the meantime has made it very, very clear. There's no excuse, industry has got to act now and not wait for the legislative program to catch up. And industry should also prepare for the substantial changes that are coming. And so it's that I want to actually deal with today. So what is the bill trying to achieve? Well, we, we're going to see a new regime. Um, doesn't really matter what size of building, I think, although clearly the, the bill is going to be focusing very much on buildings that are in excess of 18 metres tall. But we're also seeing that in Wales, there's a possibility that may move down to 11 metres. So we are already seeing a change in approach. We are seeing in the industry anyway, uh, residents in even smaller buildings having a much bigger interest in how their buildings are assessed in respect of fire safety and what's wrong with them. Um, they're all very, very interested. But traditionally what we've seen is that designers have designed, we've got contractors who have, con have developed the buildings, we've got the likes of myself going out doing fire risk assessments, we've got others undertaking general safety as well, and then we've got property managers managing and, and, and maintaining those particular buildings. And what traditionally we've seen is many of those people working in silos, ticking the boxes to turn around and say we've done certain elements, we've done certain elements. What the bill is trying to see, or to change, sorry, is the culture. And we're trying to see now or and move into an area of asking a simple question, is that building safe? And the only way that we can actually determine that is by actually fully assessing the building as part of a building safety management system. And you notice I've used the word building safety and not just fire safety, because the bill as it currently stands is interested not only in fire safety, but also structural safety as well. And so there's going to be a, a, a mix here of the areas of traditional building safety, electrical safety, gas safety, et cetera, and that will have an impact on fire safety. So building safety is going to be the area that we need to focus on. And all of this has going to be wrapped up within a technology solution. So there's gonna be a technology requirement, not only for the golden thread, which we've discussed in previous uh, seminars, but also in respect of how individuals are managing the issues that come out of a fire risk assessment or a building risk assessment. Because the new regime is now saying that the accountable person has got to deal with those issues promptly. Now, it's not defined what prompt means, but it's certainly saying that you can't wait for a year um, till the next assessment to start thinking about how you're going to be dealing with any risks that need to be controlled. So there is a need for cultural change. We are seeing that change starting to manifest itself, um, but it's certainly one which is going to have a big impact on how fire risk assessments are not only developed, but how they are published and how they are managed on an ongoing basis. So what's the risk? Well, just six days ago, the Home Office produced some new statistics um, looking at the number of fires that actually occurred um, last year, uh, certainly up until September 2021. 
Uh, according to those statistics, we had around about 9,876 uh, 9, reported fires within flats every year. Now, that's within the flats. These are dwelling fires only. That actually equates to 832 each month. And the worrying element is that's almost 28 every day. Now, these are occurring inside the flats. But traditionally, what we've seen is that the vast majority of people, when they've been undertaking fire risk assessments, have been undertaking what's called a type one fire risk assessment. Now, there are four types of assessment, type one, type two, type three, and therefore type four. The traditional type of assessment undertaken is undertaken in the common parts and the common parts only. And the reason being is that certainly in England and Wales, that actually meets the, the minimum requirements of the regulatory reform fire safety order of 2005. Now, a type one assessment, as I said, looks at the common parts only. That's obviously staircases, corridors, receptions, car parks, as well as plant rooms, etc. And it's undertaken on a non-intrusive basis. What we're starting to see is a change, not only from uh, an enforcement side, but owners are now questioning and asking, well, we need to understand what our building actually consists of. Most people do not have information relating to how the building was constructed and how good fire safety is throughout the whole of the building. So they're now switching to starting to consider a much wider scope. Most people are starting to look at type three and four assessments. Now, I mentioned that there were four types. Uh, I'm not going to go through type two. These basically cover exactly the same as a type one assessment, uh, but it's undertaken on an intrusive basis and, and hardly anyone does those. So a type three assessment, again, deals with the common parts, but also then takes into account the internal arrangements within at least a sample of the flats or a sample of the demised areas. Now, the difference between a type three and a type four assessment really base it, is based around how intrusive that particular sample is. A type three will be non-intrusive and a type four will have a degree of intrusive, albeit on a sample basis. Now, it's really important that we understand that when we're going into the flats, that we're not taking responsibility within those flats. The, the responsible person cannot take responsibility within those flats for particular issues that are actually occurring. What, we're, what we should be noting is that where those issues are found, then there is a requirement to talk to the leaseholder. There is already that requirement within the regulator reform fire safety order, there's a requirement to cooperate and coordinate your activities. So there's a very clear requirement for you to actually ensure that once you've undertaken a much wider scope of assessment uh, and effectively look more at a, what's called a whole building approach, a more holistic approach, then any issues that you find outside of those common areas need to be discussed with the tenants themselves. Last thing I wanna say in respect of this type of assessment is that we've had some significant discussions with the NFCC, the National Fire Chiefs Council, and their opinion is very clear. They don't nationally see a major issue with the type of assessment. They wanna know that the assessment is suitable and sufficient. And certainly their belief is that in large, uh, multiple occupied residential blocks that a type three and four would most probably be the most appropriate that will deliver that suitable and sufficient basis. But they do say that in other, other types of building, a type one may continue to be acceptable. So we are seeing uh, a, a change in the way that uh, people are looking at buildings and moving from the very traditional, very, very strict scope of common area only to one that actually is now much more holistic in its approach. Now that's exactly what Dame Judith was trying to uh, talk about and actually made recommendations within her independent review. She stated very clearly that it, she felt that uh, it was for the duty holder for a high rise residential block to be able to demonstrate 
that the fire risk assessment for the whole building has been undertaken. And then review that on a regular basis, depending upon the risk and as agreed with the regulator. So we can see that the government accepted that particular approach and therefore within the building safety bill, they have actually suggested within section 72 that in order to achieve this, the accountable person and not the responsible person, and I'll talk about the differences about that in a few seconds, the accountable person will be required to as soon as reasonably practicable after the relevant time, assess the building safety risks relating to the building. And they're not talking about the common areas of the building, they're talking about the building. So I think it's fair to, to assume that that means the whole building. And the relevant time is then further defined within that section, and it actually makes a requirement that the time when the building becomes occupied, or if later, when the person becomes the accountable person for the building. The bill then goes on and explains that it will be, or will be a requirement for a new accountable person to undertake a new assessment. In addition to that, it's very clear that we believe that Dame Judith was looking for a, an annual requirement, and it's more than likely going to be a requirement from the regulator that uh, on, the, on the higher risk buildings, that uh, an annual assessment or something that may even be a, a, a lesser frequency, perhaps every six months, may be required for certain types of buildings. So I said, for us, I think it's really important. There needs to be a cultural change now between how assessors currently undertake assessments, they're very technical in their basis, um, to one now that is gonna have to start to seek new audiences because the bill actually requires those assessments to be made available not only to the accountable person and the regulator, but others such as the residents themselves. So you can imagine Mr. and Mrs. Smith on floor four trying to read a fire risk assessment written by a fire engineer, trying to understand what it actually means to them. So there's certainly going to be a need for our industry to change the way that we produce fire risk assessments to enable those who are not technically minded to understand what those risks are and what they need to do in order for those to be managed. So we've got the building safety bill making changes in respect of the future of risk assessments, uh, specifically on who is actually required to undertake them. But effectively, what we've now got is a bit of a dichotomy because whilst the bill is going to make some amendments to the regulator reform fire safety order, it doesn't actually make amendments in respect of what's called the responsible person. So under the bill, we are going to have an accountable person hanging on this accountability hook. So they will be held accountable. And as you can see, they have a duty to develop and assess the building safety risks. Now, this will be uh, enforced by the regulator. And that regulator will be through the health and safety executive in England and other parties in, in Wales. But we've also got the continuing role of the responsible person under the regulator reform fire safety order. Now, again, that's only for England and Wales. It's a duty holder elsewhere. Now, that's the person who's actually in control of the premises. And they also are responsible for developing, undertaking what's called a suitable and sufficient fire risk assessment, amongst other elements as well, such as securing general fire precautions, putting in place fire safety arrangements, training, maintenance of means of escape, and obviously clearly maintenance of fire safety equipment. So we've got a situation here where we've got the accountable person who's going to be accountable, held to account, who's going to be monitored by the regulator. And we've therefore also now got a responsible person who's going to be monitored by a different regulator, i.e. the fire authority. 
two people required to undertake risk assessments and two enforcers. How that is going to be dealt with in the past is going to be interesting to deal with. Um, I certainly don't have a particular answer at the moment on, on how it's going to be. I would imagine the accountable person will trump the, uh, the responsible person. But I don't know how that is going to go down with the various enforcing authorities. So carrying on then, the bill also, um, as it's an enabling bill, has or requires the government to introduce uh, new regulations. And the government have produced a, a raft of, of uh, draft regulations that is sitting on a desk somewhere waiting for the, the bill to be enacted. Um, and one of those uh, regulations is the draft higher risk buildings prescribed principles of management of building safety risk regulations. That's an easy name to remember. It actually only consists of one section. Uh, and that one section requires that anybody who's involved in the management of building safety um, under what will be called then the Building Safety Act are required to do quite a few different elements. But in this instance, they've got to evaluate building safety risks and then identify the proportional measures required to reduce um, and address and mitigate all of those building safety risks. They've got to give the collective protective measures priority over individual protective measures. That I would suggest is a, a requirement therefore to look on a more holistic basis, a more whole building basis. So again, move it from the traditional type one assessment to a type three and look at the whole building. To not just rely upon, as people have done in the past, um, the fact that the building happen to have been approved under a certain building regulations, but now to adapt to technical progress. So we often hear when uh, we're actually submitting our findings to our clients, that, oh, well, you know, it was approved under the building regulations. Well, that may be the case, but we've got to now address and deal with the technical progress and technical change. And in addition to that, the two other elements that affect assessments is about where reasonable to do so to replace the dangerous with the non-dangerous or less dangerous. Um, it, we've got no definition in respect of what it means by non-dangerous or less dangerous, but I'm sure we'll get to that. And in addition, consider the impact on the residents. So, so far then we've got a change in culture, we've got changes in respect of the building safety bill, and we've got these new regulations sitting behind, waiting for that bill to come online. What we've also had though, as a, another response to the Grenfell Tower inquiry, is a piece of legislation called the Fire Safety Act 2021 come online. Now it's a quite a small piece of legislation, only four sections. It took over a year to pass through parliament, but it received royal assent on the 29th of April, 2021. Uh, like the Building Safety Bill, it's an enabling act. It requires Parliament or the Welsh Assembly to pass regulation to implement or commence. And, and to date, we've got the, Royal, the Welsh Assembly have implemented the act. Um, and so it's in force um, in Wales under the Fire Safety Act 2021 commencement Wales regulations. In respect of England, as of yesterday evening, we're still waiting for a commencement date in England. Um, so at the moment, we really got no idea when the act is going to be fully enforced. Now, the effect of this particular piece of legislation actually amends the regulator reform fire safety order and changes the scope. Uh, it's widely been known now that the scope is going to now include building structure, the external walls and the common parts, as well as all of the doors between the domestic premises and the common parts itself. So again, another change to fire risk assessments going forward. But the difficulty we've got now is the fact that we've got a section in Wales that's enforced and required, uh, and it's not enforced in England. And in fact, what we've now got is we've got four albeit relatively similar pieces of legislation, but we've got four regimes in the four nations. We've got the regulator reform order, 
in England. We've got the amended version in Wales. We've got two versions in Scotland, uh, the Fire Safety Scotland Act and the Fire Safety Scotland regulations. And in Northern Ireland, we've got the former Fire Safety Regulations 2010 and the Fire and Rescue Services Northern Ireland Order of 2006. So in theory, we've got four different uh, requirements um, across the four nations. So if you are managing um, across those four nations, you have four different requirements in order to meet. So changing culture, new legislation in place so in some areas, new legislation waiting to be enforced, and new legislation currently in government waiting uh, further consideration by the House of Lords. What we've also now got is a change in how fire and rescue services are enforcing. We're certainly seeing a, a, a vastly increased level of enforcement from fire and rescue services. So we've certainly seen them requiring in enforcement notices, for example, that not only do the responsible person have to meet their current re responsibilities, but also they are requiring assessments to consider the whole building rather than just the common parts. They are, in some instances, asking in England uh, responsible persons to meet the requirements of the Fire Safety Act, even though it's not in force. In some instances, we are seeing uh, fire and rescue services meet or ask uh, responsible persons to meet some of the requirements of the building safety bill. Again, not enforced, um, and it's currently going through Parliament. And in a small number of areas, we're also seeing fire and rescue services um, ask uh, or require responsible persons to actually meet some of the recommendations that are actually outlined in the phase one uh, Grenfell Tower inquiry report. Again, they're not, they've not even passed into regulation at the moment. So we're certainly seeing uh, an increase. Now, I understand, and I think most of us will understand that they're, they're acting on, on the right basis. They've, they've taken what the government have said, that we've got to make changes now and not wait for the legislative programme to catch up. But it does mean that with all of the other changes that we've got and with that enforcement, effectively, we've got a perfect storm. Effectively, we're seeing, an, as I said, that increase in fire and rescue services um, serving notices on owners, and they are requiring those owners to actually act within relatively short, defined periods of time. We've also then got the Landlords and Tenant Act, which actually requires input from the tenants. That requires consultation. That as well is causing some particular issues because much of that consultation asks, um, and we've seen this, asking the property managers, well, is this a legal requirement? And in many instances, some of the requirements are not a legal requirement. So we've got the Landlord and Tenant Act actually causing a little bit of a storm as well. In addition to that, uh, we've all heard, and just this week we've had yet more statements from politicians vowing to pursue contractors and developers for money, um, actually suggesting that tenants will either not have to pay or there will be limits on how much those they will have to pay. Now that in itself has manifested a position where the tenants themselves are starting to resist spending that money. And if they are spending money, then we are already seeing that property managers are being questioned. Um, in some instances, uh, pretty severely questioned uh, through tribunals about why they are spending certain money. I, I literally had a, a conversation with a, a tenant two nights ago who was asking why uh, the particular managing agent was undertaking a review of the external wall because it wasn't a requirement in England. Um, so we, we actually are already seeing that as part of the perfect storm. We've got a relatively slow legislative program. Um, I think it's fair to say that we've got, in some instances, um, it partially stalled, um, especially in England. Um, uh, and it's taking time for that legislative program to catch up with the requirements that others are asking for. And then, of course, if you operate across all of the different countries uh, and nations in the UK, you've got different country approaches and, and different approaches 
which uh, rely upon you now to actually be aware of exactly what is required uh, and where they are required. And, and the only other element that I haven't introduced here is insurance. And, and I don't want to do too much about that because I'm going to leave Russ to, to move on now and talk about the insurance side of it. But we certainly are seeing uh, increased insurance costs due to inadequate fire protection um, and a much hardened uh, insurance market. So for us, it's very clear we've got this perfect storm at the moment. We've got a cultural change that is pushing for change. We've got others, though, who are slowing that change down. And we've got other systems um, and, and, and situations in place that actually are actually preventing, in many instances, uh, the improvements that we're actually looking for in respect of fire risk assessments and building risk assessments. Um, so the future, it's very difficult to actually turn around and say exactly what's going to happen. One thing I will say is that there is going to be a need for continual change um, and there's going to be a need for property managers, tenants, assessors and enforcers to work together to actually ensure that uh, we're getting the best out of any assessment program. I'm going to pass over now to uh, Russ, who's going to take you through his slides. Thank you, David. Um, I hope everybody can hear me OK. Thanks so much for this opportunity to talk to you um, and uh, be here as part of the, uh, the British Property Federation uh, series on fire and fire safety. So thanks for the opportunity. I just want to start this with a, a small anecdote from my career. Um, I, took, I was appointed as the uh, International Group Fire Strategy Manager for BAA when we had the BAA, if you recall, after the uh, Burger King fire at Terminal 1. Some of you may recall that a long, long time ago. And I remember going up to the Managing Director of Scottish Airports. Uh, and before I even said a word, as I entered his office, he said, don't tell me how many times I can go to prison and how many pieces of legislation I'm possibly not complying with. Tell me what you're going to do to improve my business. And it, um, it really stuck in my mind that uh, when we address this issue around compliance, I, I may think we're looking at this from slightly the wrong angle. So what I'm going to try and do is, in my contribution to this dialogue about fire risk assessment, is perhaps look at it from a slightly different angle, um, and one which is basically set on much more of a commercial imperative. So, so my first question is, who is the client? Um, talk about that in a minute. Uh, next, please, David. Um, then I'm going to go on to um, uh, this. Assuming that high high rise buildings are co-compliant co is a big mistake. So if you have a, a building stock, uh, a lot of the regulators um, and other people that are involved in this, uh, their, their, their datum, their starting point is that the buildings are co-compliant. Um, and I think that's a big mistake. And I just want to talk about that briefly. And then um, thirdly, um, I think in the last programme, you spoke about the golden thread. It, as a, as a, somebody that used to do fire risk assessments, I don't, I don't do many of them anymore. Um, if you do, do not provide the fire risk assessor with adequate information, they are doing their job with one or both hands tied behind their backs. And you've probably all seen fire risk assessments reports that the first three pages are caveats about um, get out clauses because they haven't had access to relevant information. Um, and it's my contention that a large body of work that was undertaken when the RRO first came out are probably worthless on the basis that they didn't have access to adequate information. Uh, and that's a reality that I think we do need to embrace with the new building safety bill. So just going on to the first slide then, who is the client? Well, you can see here, um, this is really a philosophical question for you to really think about when you, when you commission a fire risk issue. Assessment. Who is the client? Is it a, are you the person paying for it? Is it the responsible person? Is it the accountable person? Is it the building safety regulator that's going to be enforced now with the building safety bill? Is it the local fire service? And importantly for me, is the client the consumer of fire safety in that building? We, I'm afraid, become in the industry, we become obsessed with compliance uh, to the regulations and law and guidance. And I think the one constituency that gets left out of this, in my experience anyway, is what I call the consumers of fire safety. Um, and they're the people that actually reside in the buildings. And I completely agree with David. Uh, if you offered them the significant findings of a fire risk assessment, they'll probably look at you rather blankly. Um, you know, if you've got a medical diagnosis 
from a doctor and it went into lots of medical language, you'd probably be completely bemused. And yet we think that that's acceptable to provide that level of information. And I'm going to try and give you an idea about how we can combat that. Um, and lastly, is it the insurer of the building? So what I want you to, to think about briefly is the insurance dynamic within this. Um, and to try and illustrate that, I've got this uh, diagram, uh, which I call the fire risk corridor. So here we have uh, a journey. Um, we're starting on the left hand side and going to the right hand side. I call this the fire risk corridor. And we obviously want to move to an optimum solution for the building. And, and really, that's a, a question that you need to consider what it is for you. So we know to start off with first one there that if we build a building, we have to satisfy legal compliance. Now, here's the thing. Wherever you are in the four countries of the United Kingdom, that legal compliance is predicated on life safety only. That is, everybody has to get out of that building unharmed um, and uninjured by the, the, the fire or the products of fire. The building can fall down, you can cause massive environmental damage and your business, your hospital, your school, your university, whatever, airport, can go out of business and everybody can lose their jobs. The, the, the regulations are not interested in that. And therefore, it's my contention that the bar is actually very low. Um, if you want to go one step further than that, and you want to build in some building preservation so that your building will probably survive the foreseeable fires that may occur in the kitchen, for example, and other areas, um, then you probably want to build in a high degree of resilience. Now, some of you may be aware that the risk authority used to produce a, a copy of the building regulations, sorry, approved document B, um, that was written with enhancements for insurance requirements. That, that's now actually been withdrawn. I hope a new version will be available. Um, if we go one step further from building preservation, then we've got business continuity. That means that if your building does suffer a fire, then you'll still be able to use it largely to carry out whatever you're doing. Now, one of the issues that we now seeing in high rise residential blocks is that even with a fairly small fire on the external envelope of the building or in the building, we may well have to decant all the people out of that building. And I, I'm finding the clients that I'm working with, they're wholly unprepared as we've seen in other major fires. What do I do with 50, 60, 70 families or tenants that are now dumped onto the roadside at two o'clock in the morning in the middle of February when it's freezing cold? Um, so we really don't want that to happen. So if we can limit the, the, the impact of fires on the building. And then the last, the last level on here is what I call fully protect, full flexibility of use or FM Global, which is the world's largest insurance company. They call that fully protected status where the building has such levels of resilience that fires are extremely unlikely, or when they do occur, they're detected and they're put out normally by sprinklers very quickly. Now, not many clients I know want to go to that level of resilience. And the reason for that is, is we're fixated on CapEx. So if we just illustrate that journey, the, the normal logic here is that the further we go down this particular route, um, then the more expensive the building is gonna to cost to build. Uh, capex and, we, and we're, we're, we're utterly fixated with capex i've sat on many project boards for large investment in buildings and it's all about capex where i have been had some degree of progress in my career uh, is where if you can persuade people not to consider this through the lens of the development capex but look at it through the opex and, and take a 25 year period now if you do that and you put in all of those costs, you'll find that the high degrees of resilience that you build into that building, actually your operating costs over 25 years go down significantly. And that's probably largely down to your insurance, your insurance costs, et cetera. So I think there's a, there's a, commercial, uh, there's a commercial story to be told with fire risk assessment um, and how it can actually add to the business. If your buildings represent a better risk to the insurance industry, if you can demarcate them from the ones that are purely being built to that, that bar at the lowest level, i.e. building regs compliance, then I think over a 20, 25, 30 year period, you're gonna get a massive payback, in my opinion, um, uh, for, for looking at it in that way. And yet this very rarely happens. In a design and build world, this very rarely happens. It's build it, get it up as quickly as possible, spend, as little as possible in most cases, and then move on to the next project. And, and little regard is given to the fire risk over even a, a modest 25 year period. And I would commend that to you when you're looking at big projects. Thanks, David. Now, uh, I call this diagram Mind the Gap. Um, and I'm an engineer and I like graphs. Uh, and hopefully it's, uh, it, it, it says a lot in just one diagram. So what you've got here on, on the vertical axis is the fire safety status of the building. 
and along the horizontal axis, time. Now, the, 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 the blue line there, C, that, that is the level of safety that you would, um, you would get if you complied with the building regulations or wherever you may be in the four home nations. And it's showing there a steady state, which is very unusual that it is at a steady state. Um, B is the level of insurance, the level of fire safety that your insurer would prefer to have in that building. And it's normally in excess of that. Uh, and then ironically, A, the yellow line, that's the, that's the perceived level of safety in the building from the residents in my, they often think it's a lot better than it actually is. I have to tell you as a, as a chartered fire engineer, and I've looked at many, many EWS1 forms, I'm one of the unicorns that can sign these forms um, over the past two years. Um, the, the, the red line D is the reality of what I'm seeing. Um, and again, another misconception is that building control are the arbiters of whether the building is safe to occupy. Uh, building control have never performed that duty. They are there to say that a process has been followed. And so there's a misconception that when you enter that building and it's been signed off, that that building is completely safe and it's completely finished. I have to tell you from my experience, that's very rarely true. So we have this gap between the reality of compliance um, and um, you know, what, the, what compliance with the building regulations say and what the actual is. Now, if we have, as you can see here, a gap, uh, and over the lifetime of the building and you carry out major works or refurbishment, that gap can actually get a lot bigger. Um, and when it does get bigger, you notice there that I've, I've used the, the letter E there to, to demarcate. Most high-rise residential buildings are, are are based on a stay put remain in place strategy and that's the same around the world um, my my worry is that when you get this gap when that gap gets to a certain size that stay put evacuation strategy may not be valid but all of the regulators and enforcers and everybody else they want to work around the datum of compliance and i don't necessarily believe that's where we are so there has to be a much more i think um realistic starting point for these assessments and uh, fire risk assessment is the best way to do that um, now david mentioned um, um, so it, yeah if anybody's got any questions on this i mean it's based on my experience um, and I'm, I'm happy to be challenged on it now david mentioned about the output from fire risk assessments is it meaningful to the consumers of fire safety well one of the things we've developed in the tall building fire safety network next slide please david um, Sorry, I'm just jumping one. This is um, this is my shopping list. So when I was a fire risk assessor, when I was doing fire risk assessments, you can see on here, this is what I used to send to my clients before I do the fire risk assessment. This list has been much more populated now in the, the new um, British Standard 8644. But you can see on here, I've asked for 17 pieces of information, uh, current, current fire safety management structure, existing fire risk assessments, copy of the fire strategy, and so on and so forth. Um, I have to tell you, uh, I, I, did, I completed hundreds of fire risk assessments. I never, ever received all 17 pieces of information. The vast majority of the time, I had two or three of these items I asked for, I got. And, and when I got them, they were obsolete, out of date, inaccurate. Um, or I was shown a cardboard box in the lift motor room full of CD-ROMs, which was the CDM safety file. Sort your way through that lot, if you will, as a fire risk assessor. So you're then reduced as a fire risk assessor to, to walking around a building almost from first principles. Um, and you're looking at walls and, and, and other elements of structure, et cetera, which you've got really no knowledge of. Um, so I just, again, a reality gap. When you're receiving these fire risk assessments, clearly you want the individual doing it to be competent, but there is, they may be technically competent, but they haven't got x-ray vision. And if they, ha they haven't got access to these plans, I actually think we need to move to a stage now where fire risk assessors need to refuse to do the fire risk assessments if they're not provided with the adequate information in the first place. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with these meaningless reports, which have got pages of caveats in the front of them, explaining why they couldn't give you a comprehensive report because they couldn't they couldn't access certain pieces of information. Anyway, I think hopefully I've made that point. To make the fire risk assessment accessible to the consumers of fire safety. Um, We've developed this. Now, if you walk into a restaurant, a cafe, anywhere now in the UK, on the front of the door, you'll see a green, um, you'll see a green sticker marked from one to five, and it's a food hygiene rating. And it's been incredibly successful in the UK in driving up standards of food hygiene. So what we've developed in the uh, Tall Building Fire Safety Network is a fire safety mark. 
And we use the term mark, if you remember from history, the, the lead marks that we used to put on the outside of buildings. So this is the equivalent of that food hygiene scheme. Um, and it's a simple graphic and it would reside in your reception in some publicly uh, admissible area. And it gives a, a, an at a glance um, indication of the level of fire safety in the building. So this is, the, this is a proposed output from your fire risk assessor. So your fire risk assessor would do the fire risk assessment, then he or she would then say, given the evidence that I found, I could then, um, I could then recognize that by giving this particular building uh, a rating of one, two, three, four, and five. Now, clearly, if it's a hotel or another residential building, you might wish to make sure that the building um, was a five. It could be appropriate that it could be one, two, or three, proportionate to the building. But clearly, you know, to get a five, you have to have sprinklers. To get a five in a tall building, you have to have two staircases. Um, and, and so we, we, are, we, have, we are rolling this out. It is completely voluntary. There is no, this is, no, this is not part of any compliance. And we, we'd be delighted if anybody would like to be um, an early adopter of this scheme and get these in, into their buildings. We believe it will drive up standards. Um, um, so, yeah, if anybody's interested, please get in touch. Uh, next slide, please, David. Uh, and just finally, if you'll forgive me, uh, 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 an absolutely um, shameless plug. Um, we have our conference coming up in May. That's the seventh International High Rise Tall Building Conference. It'd be great to get more property managers there if possible. And we have, for since 2000 and, um, 2011, been running a tall building fire safety management course. So we've put over 700 people through that program now. It's now a recognised uh, course with Skills for Justice, which is UCAS. Um, and it'd be great if anybody's interested in that. If you'd like more details, please visit our website, www.tourbuildingfiresafety.com. And uh, I'll be happy to join in with the Q&A session later on. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ross, and to David before you. Um, and perhaps um, if we can come off, come off slides and uh, everybody can see us uh, uh, in the, uh, our full pictures. OK, so my perspective is both from England and Wales. So we are working cross border. Uh, we sit in a role of um, supporting mostly leaseholders and resident management companies um, in thousands of properties around the UK. Um, so the challenges that we have, of course, are the mechanics of the lease and the ability for residents to raise money to do things, uh, where we've got the fire brigade serving enforcement notices wanting uh, speedy compliance um, and residents seeking uh, grant funding in some instances from the Welsh um, government uh, because they don't have the same type of building safety fund down there in Wales. Um, they actually have um, a building safety passport, which is looking at the tests that are needed. So it's how do you really balance and what are the government's expectations uh, with the fire service running around in order to quantify, um, let's say, how bad is the stock for the government to make decisions on budgets. Serving notices requiring um, compliance before people have had their grant applications approved. Um, giving leaseholders a situation where should they spend their own money to put themselves at risk of tribunals saying that that was um, unreasonably spent because free money was available with grants that have yet been yet to be determined or uh, granted and then of course the machinery of the leases uh, which ordinarily means that you have to set a budget in advance if you don't have a lot of money in reserves and when you do set a budget, you can collect it perhaps over two or four demand dates. So you wouldn't even have the money that you need to um, comply with the fire notice before it's due to be complied with. So we have this ridiculous situation of three um, different aspects um, all coming to this perfect storm uh, that's been shared with you this morning. And so far, very little conversation about machineries of the leases and houses to be dealt with and of course the expectation Michael Gove's words have improved from try to get the developers to cooperate to now developers plus suppliers and talking about potentially withholding uh, planning permissions as his muscles. Um, so none of this actually helps the people that are trapped unable to sell often for um, as many as two or three years now 
um, and we've got quite a lot of experience of people's properties worth easily £50,000 less. Um, and that's all well and good, perhaps, if you're an investor landlord and got some income. But if your job's just moved to another part of the country, that leaves you in a real, real problem. Um, we've got a lot of experience of developers' Q&A systems, just having been woefully inadequate um, over the years, um, or too much reliance on the subcontractor's um, own Q&A system, and there being a gap between the subcontractor's Q&A system the developer's Q&A system, um, only to find that leaseholders um, get a building, um, have had a reserve fund set perhaps low at £50 a unit to make it attractive to sell units or, or buy flats, um, to then need to almost immediately start raising money to find out if what they bought was what they thought they bought and what to do about it. Um, the only, I mean, one of the good things is the NHBC has got quite a big part to play, as of other premier guarantees, insofar as um, Section 4 cover is compliance with building regulations. So there's very little wriggle, wriggle room for the NHBC on these claims. So we're in a situation with the NHBC putting a lot of pressure on developers to try to do the right thing. But of course, then the NHBC is an insurance body that wants to pay out claims um, only when it has to. Um, so if they can't coerce a developer to do the right thing, um, then we're running around having on buildings that perhaps are new to us, that may have been through three or four agents in a number of years, find evidence to prove that some level of maintenance was carried out. Because of course, if you're talking about fire doors, the NHBC would love to think that the gaps in the doors are because the doors were not uh, maintained. When, of course, a door can't actually grow gaps if it wasn't fitted properly in the first place. So there's all this, um, let's call it dirty pushback going on, which is tying up uh, people in my teams here in no end of paperwork when you know the government's got a rhetoric to achieve a, a goal and a higher standard. But the reality of that on the street is paperwork, more paperwork, uh, grants delays, a fire service out of tune with the people giving the money, um, who's responsible and how's it gonna move? That's the question. Thanks very much, Marianne. And uh, um, conscious of time, we've got um, quite, yeah. quite quite a lot of uh, questions that have been coming through. Uh, can, can everybody hear me? Is that coming through okay? Yeah, good. Um, there's a few questions for you, David, that sort of came through at the start. Um, you'd um, um, talked about intrusive surveys. Uh, you wanted to know um, on, on from the audience, you know, does, does that always mean opening up walls? Um, you know, are, are you having to do intrusive surveys on a regular basis, um, so, say an, uh, annually? You know, and I think you mentioned um, sampling as well. What, what constitutes a good sample? Uh, okay, let's just deal with the sample. The sample is very difficult to turn around and give you a definitive figure, but what I would suggest, uh, a figure between, say, 10 and 20, 25% would be a reasonable sample uh, to give the assessor uh, confidence that they've got a good understanding. And the reason why I say a, 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 a give you a banding is it really does depend upon the type of uh, uh, building and the type of evacuation strategy. If, for example, a building relies heavily upon uh, compartmentation, a stay put, as uh, Russ was uh, explaining there, then clearly we want to make sure that the compartmentation um, is, is of, a, a, of the right level. Um, and like Russ, um, we're seeing significant uh, deficiencies in that particular area. Um, in respect of uh, the intrusive element, yes, we do go into walls. We try and go into walls um, in our side through switches um, that, that are, and openings that are already in the walls. Um, if that's not possible, then we tend to work with uh, the uh, client and their contractors in order to get into the walls um, who then are able to actually make good. That tends to mean, therefore, that we uh, have to go in through the common areas or if we are going in, uh, in within the, the tenants devised areas, they tend to be vacant areas. Uh, and the other element in respect of access that you, were, you talked about is that, yes, we, we, are, we are having difficulty getting access in some instances. Um, 
A lot of people will give you access, but it's the timing that they want to give you access. So we're having to review how we deliver assessments when we're actually undertaking those assessments. Um, but it, 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 we are seeing that, uh, but it's not a major issue. The last question you asked there was, um, should we be undertaking those assessments uh, annually? I would suggest that I would not see a requirement to undertake uh, an intrusive assessment annually. Um, I don't see the point, um, unless of course we are making changes to that building. But for me, once they've done an intrusive, once we've I've done an intrusive survey, we can then move to a non-intrusive basis uh, on a risk basis going forward. Uh, ultimately, it's got to be suitable and sufficient. Um, it's got to be able to actually inform the, those, um, those clients, as, as Russ was taking you through, um, to actually allow you to uh, ensure that you understand and, and know what measures uh, are needed in order to address and mitigate the building safety risks. And, and Marianne, some, some questions that I think um, were sort of, sort of aimed at yourself. Um, uh, around this issue of access to flats, um, yeah, man managing the issue that I think David flagged that um, your tenants are increasingly conscious that um, you know with government statements that uh, you know they, they uh, perhaps perceive they shouldn't be paying for for for, for anything. How are you managing managing? Well, it's that? not just it's not just paying for investigations. It's paying for the ongoing work. So we're in a situation in Wales where already. Uh, we've got sites where we've got 900 flats to get into and to inspect all their private doors. Now, on a site of quantum, that's not too bad because you can do it over, let's say, three or four days and get most people in on most days. But where you've got smaller sites, perhaps 10, 20 flats, um, you've got to do it all in one day um, or go back. I mean, the market rate for inspecting a residence private front door seems to be around £15. Uh, but of course, if you've got to go back and you can't do them in, all in the same day, then you're talking probably about a £300 minimum call out for a recall. So we're working out a system of, let's say, fines and penalties to make sure that we can try to get everybody through on the first time. But there's so many sites where there are no key holders on site. Uh, whether or not this is going to push up a surge in people that use key holding services, I don't know. Um, owners will think that their tenants will comply, their tenants will think that they don't want to and it's an inconvenience to them because they probably won't. So the reality of getting access to all of these flats on an ongoing basis is going to be nothing but torturous. Um, in terms of inspecting, get people to cooperate uh, with what needs to be done. Uh, we've had relatively good uptake on people wanting to have the internal flats inspected. And let's not forget that it's the council that are responsible for fire safety inside the flat, and it's the fire service that's responsible for fire safety in the common parts. So even then, we've got two different bodies potentially serving enforcement notice on two different things. Uh, but by and large, those most interested in fire safety on site are those that want to sell but can't. So those are normally the people that nominate themselves to have their sockets taken out to try and inspect walls and things rather than those um, that are not selling. Uh, that's our experience. I hope that answers the question. I think it does. And um, I'm conscious of time, and we're still running up against time. Apologies that we've not managed to get, get through all the questions this morning. Uh, um, there was one that I wanted to sort of ask to finish off on to each of you, which is um, if you're um, procuring an external fire risk assessor, you know, what, what uh, Tips could you give uh, the audience in terms of uh, you know, picking a good one? There's um, you know, a, a large market of fire risk assessors out there. Um, what, what would be your, your top tip, as it were? Uh, David, perhaps you, you first. Of course, I'm going to turn around and say come to ARC. But um, <laughs> excluding that particular part, uh, I think you, you're going to need to actually ask, ask questions of the assessor. Um, look at their past history. Uh, also, find out if they've actually uh, are a member of a uh, a body such as BAFE or something like that. Um, that means that they are being audited on a regular basis. So certainly, that would be the approach that I would take. And uh, Russ, what about your tip? Yeah, I would make sure that they, they that as well as being technically competent and from what going on what David said, ask to see previous 
uh, you know, what type of, have they done similar work on similar properties with similar types of finish? Because they, they're, you know, there are multiple different types of facades that you could be involved in on a particular building. I was looking at one the other day that had seven different types of facade finishes on it. Um, but I would also make sure that they have suitable insurance for what they're doing, professional liability insurance, because they're going to be making some fairly uh, important decisions or judgments within that assessment. And you want to make sure that they're being backed up with adequate levels. Uh, and the figure that's kind of an industry standard now is a minimum of 10 million um, professional liability insurance and make sure the conditions that are on that policy, make sure that, um, they, that, that, that they don't, that, that there's sufficient coverage on, on, that, on that policy for the work that they're doing. Um, and, and I would say, you know, do ask them about the intrusions that we said earlier on, the samples they're going to take. Um, I've, seen, I've seen some reports, you know, they're basing the whole of their report on three or four intrusions uh, on the building. Um, I, I, that's woefully inadequate. Um, and the new standard, the PAS standard that's come out, if you're not aware of it, PAS 9980, which is the guidance for the, for the external envelope of the building, whilst that goes some way in, in helping and assisting, it still doesn't give us a definitive, uh, because it's left down to the judgment of the person about how many intrusions they're gonna make. And I do think that, that you really wanna find out what the policy is um, uh, of, the, of the company, you know, on, on how many intrusions they're gonna make on the outside of the building. So that, that's, my, that's my tips. Thank you. And, and Marianne? I think taking a completely different perspective, I would be asking Fire Risk Assessor what they've had to change and what they do in recent years because that would really give you a good feel for the person having a grip of all of the things we talked about today. If they can't tell you about PAS 980, um, if they can't tell you um, about the changes in facade inspections, if they're not asking you um, for a number of those things on um, the checklist that colleagues shared earlier, um, then it means that you've got somebody who may have been on an online course, uh, but isn't actually tuned in to what matters to safety. Um, as well as asking, um, will they be inspecting um, communal fire doors? Will they be expecting that to be an extra or somebody else doing that? And will they be doing at least a sample check of residents' private doors just as an indication? Um, I mean, the conversation in the UK hasn't really moved on to fire doors forming part of compartment compartmentation. We've gone from the external facade, we've gone into compartmentation in walls, but we haven't really, until the legislation's enacted, got the final missing piece of the puzzle. Wales is ahead of us in that respect. Thank you uh, very much for all your sage advice um, and uh, a sort of a virtual clap to our speakers this, this morning. I'm, I'm grateful for the various contributions that you've made. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, you know, Russ, I hope um, it, it wasn't a shameful plug. I hope you, uh, you get people coming along to your conference and um, uh, yeah, certainly happy to pass on any volunteers that want to adopt the uh, uh, the, the rating system that you set out. Um, that seemed like a, a really good initiative. Um, I think for, for us, um, we, we're keen to do um, a, a, at least a couple more events in the series. Um, we might, uh, dare I say, um, have the next one sort of face to face or at least a, a hybrid so that uh, uh, people can come along, but can also continue to join online and uh, uh, we, we'll be putting planning into that in the next few weeks um, to bring you the fifth in the series. But uh, uh, really grateful for everybody's time today that they're able to, they're able to join you, uh, join us. I think we had about uh, uh, about three hundred and fifty at one point uh, on the on the numbers. And um, uh, uh, have a safe day, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, for tuning in. Mm -hmm.